here we go. Let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. Now you're getting to, you're, you're going to be hearing a lesson that I've done once before because uh, the Garden State Teaching Ministry put together a series of lessons and uh, um, I did one of them on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And and I really think the Spirit is a, is a really important topic that we as a church, we as, as a, a movement probably don't really talk about enough. Uh, I think that we've allowed some other groups to kind of uh, claim the Holy Spirit, and, and I think it's time for us to take the Spirit back. That's that's my own thinking on it. So I'm very excited to deliver this message. I'm really excited to be here with you guys, and uh, let's, uh, let's go through this together. You ready? All right. So I'm going to I'm going to start with a little introduction here. You got are you you ready? Okay. I want to start by helping us to understand that God's desire has always been to dwell with his people or to dwell among his people. And the Bible is full of examples of this, okay? Going back to the Old Testament, okay, a little, I'm going to lay a little Hebrew on you. Uh, the Hebrew word for dwell is shakan, okay? I, I think that's how you say it. My Hebrew is not that good, but but that's the word anyway, and it means to dwell or abide or settle down with, okay? And maybe you understand this a little bit, maybe you don't, okay? What it means to settle down with someone. Uh, in about a week and a half, Wendy and I are gonna be celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary, okay? Some, some of you, many of you know my wife, uh, we've been married for 30 years, and it's not, we're not just, two roommates who happen to share the same house, okay? We don't just dwell together. We have settled down together. And we've spent 30 years now sharing our lives together, okay? That's what this word means, and God wants to do that with you. He doesn't just want to be a roommate to you. He wants to settle down with you, and the Bible is full of verses that talk about that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We're going to look at a few, Okay, we're not going to try to look at them all because we just don't have time for that. Um, but I make reference to a few of them, and then we'll actually look at some of them and read them together. Okay. All right. So Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 says that, uh, and I will dwell among them, talking about the Israelites. And then I do want to look at Exodus chapter 29. Now, before I read it, let me say this. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of material. There's going to be a lot of scriptures, and we're going to go through it fairly quickly, okay? Uh, hopefully, because I'm a teacher for a living. That's what I do. I teach high school history. And hopefully, some of my teaching skills that I've developed over the last 23 years will, you know, help some of this sink in for you. But what I've done is I have, I have uh, forwarded the notes to Mark and to Rob both. So if I'm going through this too fast and you want to look it over on your own, they're going to send it out to you. One of the two of them will send it out to you. Okay, is that fair? Somebody acknowledge me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so Exodus chapter 29, verse 46. It says this, Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. God went through an awful lot of trouble to get them out of Egypt, out here at this point in the wilderness, for what reason? So that he could dwell among them. It was important to God. He wants to be with his people. All right, let's look at the next one. Go ahead and turn to Leviticus, those of you, you know, who have paper Bibles like me. Leviticus chapter 26, all right? I'm going to read verse 11 through 14, okay? It says, I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you will no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. So God is saying to the Israelites, he's saying a lot here, and we're going to focus on verse 11 in just a minute. But he says, I, I, I want to be with you. And I want to, I want you to be able to walk 
with your head held up, okay? I want to, to give you security and, and be with you and enable you to hold your head up high. But I wanna, I wanna really notice what it says in verse 11. It says, I will make my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you, okay? He says, I'm going to live with you and I'm going to like you. Okay, that meant a lot to me because sometimes I don't know. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but I can feel like, you know, people don't really like me. And I mean, that may or may not be true, but I've felt like that before. Okay. And, and you probably, maybe you can identify with us, or maybe you're a better person than I am. But there are people sometimes that just sort of rub you the wrong way. Okay. And, and you think, well, I know I have to love this person, but I just don't really like them. Okay. Well, God is saying to you and to us that I'm going to be with you, but I'm also going to like you, even when you're not very likable. And so that's a, a pretty nice promise that God makes to his people. Now, it's, it, the Bible continues. This is kind of at the beginning, but I want us to see that these promises, I'm going to be with you, are throughout the Bible. They're in the beginning, they're in the middle, and they're in the end. In Ezekiel 37, verse 27, he also says, my dwelling place will be with them. In John 14, verse 23. Uh, let's look at that real quick. John 14. Verse 23. He says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Okay. And then in Revelation, right at the very end, Revelation 21, it says, look, God's dwelling place is among the people. I mean, throughout the Bible, God has made it clear he wants to dwell, he wants to shakan, right, settle down with each of us. So how does he do this? How has God chosen to dwell with us? Okay, this is pretty cool. He has made us his temple, and we're going to talk about what that means that God has made us his temple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 16, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? God dwells in our midst, okay? Now, I want to take a moment to talk about some Greek here. I gave you one Hebrew word, and now I'm going to give you the same word in Greek. That word dwell comes from the Greek word oike, which means to live in or dwell in. But I want to point out that it's very similar to the Greek word for house, oikos, okay? One's a verb and the other's a noun, but they're very similar. It means basically when, when he says oike, right, that he oikes in our midst, that he is housed in our midst, okay? Uh, Later on in 2 Corinthians 6.16, 6, it says, we are his temple. And then Paul quotes from something I just shared with you, Leviticus 26.12. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. And so God has chosen to make us his temple and dwell in us and put his Holy Spirit inside of us. Okay? So he walks with us every day. Why? Because he's housed within us in the form of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's pretty good news, honestly, that God is willing to live inside of us in the form of the Holy Spirit. All right, so I just want to talk for just a minute about how special that is and how awesome that is for each one of us. So each one of us is the equivalent of the temple in Jerusalem, right? I mean, before the temple was built, maybe, you, you know, you probably know enough about the Old Testament to remember this. God dwelt in the tabernacle, right? God dwelt in a tent that they would carry around. But then when David became king, king he said, it's, it's not right for God to live in a tent. So I want to build a temple. But God didn't let him build the temple. He had his son Solomon do it. Now Solomon was wealthy by any standard. He was super wealthy and built an incredible temple in Jerusalem and the estimates on this temple were that to, in today's dollars, it would cost billions, okay? I mean, it was gold everywhere. I mean, it was fabulous. And it's, it's pretty wild to think that 
God lived in that temple, right? God's glory filled it when they first opened it up. And we, each one of us, is equivalent to that, that that was the temple that Solomon built, and it was fabulous, but we're just as fabulous because God has chosen to dwell in us. The presence of God is dwelling in us. Now, for, for you history people, here's what happened to that temple. Generations go by, and they're using the temple, but later on, the Babylonians come in and take over Jerusalem and destroy the temple, okay? And they basically take the gold of the temple and take it back to Babylon with them. And after a period of 70 years or so, people come back to Jerusalem and rebuild this temple. And so from that time, you know, you, you may recognize names like Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah. That's the time period where they rebuild this temple. And this temple stands from that time through the rest of the Old Testament, through that 400 years between the Old and the New Testament, through the life of Jesus, but then gets destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, right? That's called the, the, the second temple period. Now, before Jesus is born, Herod the Great spends 46 years refurbishing this temple. So much so, I mean, and, and it may not have reached back to the splendor of Solomon's temple, probably not, but Mark 13 says that as the disciples were walking through the temple, they commented that it was, in their words, magnificent, okay? Look at this magnificent building, okay? And so the, the first temple, magnificent. The second temple, magnificent. We are equivalent to those things. I, I hope that encourages you, encourages me. I want to share this with you. This is from uh, a book called The Epic of Eden, written by Sandra Richter. She, and this is what she has to say about this whole idea, the presence. And when she says presence, she's talking about the presence of God. The presence from which Adam and Eve were driven, that rested on Mount Sinai with thunder and storm, which sat enthroned above the cherubim, now resides in you. You and I, and we as the church, are designed to be that place to which believer and unbeliever can come and find God. Moreover, our restored lives are God's testimony to the nations that he lives and dwells among us. And whereas the temple was one building that only could only be in one place, the church is an ever-expanding community that is slowly, steadily bringing the presence to the farthest reaches of the world. Okay, so you get it? You are a mobile temple. Solomon's temple was stuck in Jerusalem. But you and I, we are mobile temples that can go all over the place carrying the presence of God with us because the presence of God dwells in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you guys with me so far? Excellent, excellent. So what we're going to talk about next is receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, so how do we get this Spirit? Okay, some of you may know the answer to that. How do we get it? And when we do get it, what does it do for us? Okay, you ready? Okay. God makes promise oh, chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 it says and afterward i will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and your daughters will prophesy your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions even on my servants both young uh, both men and women i will pour out my spirit in those days now I've, I've loved this verse for many years okay and when it first came to my attention i was a young man and i had vision now, I'm going to be 59 next week, okay? Um, you may find that hard to believe, but it's true. I'm going to be 59, okay? And so now I'm not, I'm not a young man. I'm an old man. Uh, I'm a, probably at least a generation older than anybody else on this call, right? But I still get to be visionary. I guess still get to, to dream dreams, and I love that. And then in verse 29, that, that this is going to be on all of God's servants, both men and women. The, this is for everybody young and old, men and women. I love that about this. But the, really the focus, the thing I want us to get is that there's a prophecy here that one day God is going to pour out his spirit on his people. Okay, you got that? You with me? All right, so let's move over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, so you get it? Joel 2 promises the Spirit, Acts 2, the Spirit comes. Okay, and so they're out there speaking in different languages because they have that gift of the Holy Spirit, and people start accusing them of being drunk. And so Peter stands up and says, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes through the same prophecy that I just shared with you. Okay. He's saying, you remember, Joel, remember when God promised to pour out his Holy Spirit? That's now. That's what's happening right now. God is pouring out his Spirit on us. Okay. And so then Peter starts into this sermon. You've probably read it at some point. He starts into this sermon and he really convicts people. And so it, basically he's saying, God came to us and you killed him. Okay. And so people get convicted. And then the people hear this and they were cut to the heart in verse 37 and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Okay. Peter replies in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And I have it in bold because this is important. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So we understand this. This is where we get the Holy Spirit, right? So if you're a baptized believer, you have the Spirit living in you, right? Okay. So just to recap that few verses, God promises the Holy Spirit in Joel 2. He pours out the Holy Spirit onto his people in Acts 2. We receive the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 2.38, through baptism. Now, I want to pause here for just a moment, uh, because, and this is my own thought, okay? But I think a lot of times when we study the Bible with people, we focus on how baptism removes something negative, sin. And that's good. It does. We should focus on that. But I think we should focus also on the positive that we get when we get baptized, and that is the gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? Because we're getting rid of something bad, but we're also getting with that something really good. And I think that, again, my opinion, I think that that, that would be a, a good focus for all of us and, you know, to, to have a better understanding of what we're getting. Okay, so what I want to do is share a few things about what having the Spirit does for us, okay? In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, and also in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, it tells us that the Spirit testifies that we are God's children. Now, we're going to come back and look at those two side by side in just a minute, okay? But just to understand that the Spirit tells us that we're God's children. In 2 Corinthians 1, and also in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5, it says that the Spirit guarantees our future. That's good. I, I want to know what my future is, but the Spirit guarantees me that it's, well, my salvation. That's good news. Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We can feel God's love because of that Spirit. Uh, keeping in step with the Spirit causes us to bear the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at Galatians 5 for just a minute. Okay, and this is important, the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, starting in verse 22, and I'm going to read down through 25. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Keeping in step with the Spirit is going to enable us to bear the fruits of the Spirit, right? Apple trees, by nature, bear apples, do they not, right? Isn't that just the nature of an apple tree? If it's a good, good apple tree, it's going to give apples. 
The same way, if we are filled with the Spirit, we will, by nature, bear the Spirit's fruit. In this case, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. So it's very important that we keep in step with the Spirit. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later on, too. All right? Okay, let's look at these two verses side by side. We're going to compare Romans chapter 8, verse 16, with Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Romans 8 says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Okay, because we have the Spirit, we're God's children. Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So this says that since we're his children, we have the Spirit. So which one is it? Do we have the Spirit because we're his children, or are we his children because we have the Spirit? Before we jump into some kind of chicken and egg argument, the answer is yes. Okay, yes to both. All right. All right. A couple more things that the Spirit does for us. There are two verses that talk about spirits that the Spirit gives us, and I want to dwell on those for just a minute. Okay. Second Timothy chapter one verse seven. Let's look at that real quick. Second Timothy 1, 7. I'm going to lay a little bit more Greek on you. Um, it says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Okay. Now, in, in the NRSV, it says that it's a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline, that the spirit gives us these three spirits, the spirit of power, the spirit of love, the spirit of self-discipline. Okay. I want to talk about what that spirit of power means. It comes from the Greek word dynamaos, okay, which we get our word dynamite from, among other things, right? And it is often translated as power, but that's not the only thing it can mean. It can also mean ability, okay? I don't know. Maybe you've noticed it. I, I certainly have. Now you see a brother get up in front of the church and share, and he's nervous, and he struggles, Okay. And then the next time he's like this smooth, polished speaker, right? Am I the only one who's seen that? Probably not, right? Well, what's going on here? Well, God has given him this, this ability, right? This, this spirit of dynamos, this new ability, suddenly somebody who wasn't a smooth speaker has suddenly become very smooth, okay? And that's not the only thing, the only way that God works. He can give us uh, power and ability that maybe we didn't have before. That's the spirit of dynamaos. The spirit of love, agapes, right? You guys all know the word agape, I'm sure. Okay, this is just another form of the same word. And the spirit of self-discipline. So the spirit gives us these spirits. That's good news. Look in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17, verse 17. Ephesians 1, 17. It says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Okay, so God gives us a spirit of wisdom. And he also gives us a spirit of revelation. Now, I got to be honest with you. For the first few times that I read this, I said, spirit of revelation, what does that even mean? But I had the, the I don't know, the forethought one day to actually read the rest of the verse. It tells us what it means, that the spirit of revelation is a spirit that enables us to know God better, right? Read the rest of it. It gives us this spirit. Why? So that you can know him better. God wants to be with you and wants you to know him. So <clears throat> the Bible talks about the spirit of faith, spirit of grace, other spirits, but it says specifically in these two verses that the spirit gives us these spirits. So there's a lot to be gained by having the Holy Spirit inside of us. But if this lesson was just a lesson about how to get the spirit inside of you, we've already talked about that would be done. But we don't just want the spirit in us. We want to be filled with it. That's, that's the goal. That's the aim. Don't just be satisfied to have the spirit inside of you. Let's make sure that we are getting filled up with God's Spirit. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 5, 
verse 18 through 21. It says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay. Here comes some more Greek for you. That word, plerusthe, is translated filled. Now, in Greek, verbs come in, in, in different moods, in different voices, in different tenses. Okay, there's all kinds of stuff at work here. All right. So I'm going to share some of this with you. The mood is imperative. It's a command. So we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Not a suggestion. Okay. We're commanded. Be filled with the Spirit. Also notice that it is a plural. It's not a singular. It's not singling one person out and saying, that guy's got to be filled with the Spirit. This applies to all of us. We all need to be filled with the Spirit. It's passive. Now, I'm going to take a minute to explain what that means. This comes in the passive voice, okay? Now, Greek verbs can be active, they can be middle, or they can be passive. And I'm going to briefly explain what that means, okay? Now, if I were to say, Rob hit me. Now, Rob would never do that, okay? I, at least I don't think he would. He never has yet. We've been friends for a long time. Okay, yeah, he is saying no, for those of you who don't see this. Rob would never hit me, but let's just say Rob hit me. Okay, hit in that case is an active verb. Rob is the person doing the action. He's the subject of the sentence, and he has hit me. I could say it like this. I was hit by Rob. That makes me the subject of the sentence, and it is a passive verb because I'm not hitting. Rob is hitting, okay? And so I am the one, I'm getting hit, okay? And so if it's passive, there's some force at work on you. Now, the middle voice would be Rob hits himself, okay? Which he probably doesn't do that either, okay? That'd be my guess, all right? I'm having a little fun at Rob's expense. I'm really enjoying that. I hope you are too, Rob. Okay. Okay. And so this is a passive verb. We don't fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Digest on that for a minute. We don't fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. There is some outside force at work that does the filling of us with the Spirit. Well, what is that? Well, it's God. God wants to fill you up with his Spirit. Okay. And the last thing is, it is a present tense. Okay? That means that we're always to be filled with the Spirit, because no matter what moment in time you're in, it's going to be the present, right? We can't be in the past, and we can't be in the future, and so we're always to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so let's look at this verse together a, a couple times more here, actually. It says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. OK, some groups have taken being filled with the spirit to mean things that Paul did not mean here. OK, and they sort of lose control of themselves, but they think that's being filled with the spirit. The spirit does not mean being filled with the spirit doesn't mean losing control. In fact, it means the opposite of that. If you remember, self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. I got that from John Stott, Baptism and Fullness, that he wrote uh, on page, well, on page 73. OK, I didn't come up with that on my own. All right, let's look at it one more time, because here's what I want us to think about in regards to this verse. What does being filled with the Holy Spirit look like? Okay, and I color-coded it for you. Okay, you see that? If we as a group are all filled with the Holy Spirit, here's what we're going to look like when we're together. We're going to have spiritual fellowship. See that? We're going to speak to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. We're going to have that spiritual fellowship. We're going to have heartfelt worship, okay? We're going to sing and make music from our heart to the Lord. You know, sometimes when we're all together, I just kind of like to look around and watch other people as they sing, because you can see some people who are really feeling it, okay? And I really enjoy that. Uh, 
you know, and I can tell that, that what they're doing is coming from their heart. But when, when we're filled with the Spirit, that's how we all are. When we're filled with the Spirit, we're, we're down to the blue line now. We're, we're grateful. We have a heart filled with gratitude, always giving thanks to the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the last one is mutual submission. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, usually we kind of link that with the stuff that comes after because he goes through household codes, right? But I think what Paul is saying here is that, that when we're filled with the Spirit, we're going to submit to each other, okay? We're going to submit to each other in things. And so this is what, I got this from John Stott, Baptism and Fullness as well, okay? And, but I think that when we look like this, and we can't fake it, I mean, we can fake some of it, but only for a little while, right? If we're really filled with, with the Spirit as a group, as individuals, this is what we're going to look like. We're going to have great spiritual fellowship. We're not just going to talk about sports. We can talk about sports, but we talk about spiritual matters too. We're going to be together having heartfelt worship, and we're going to be grateful, and we're going to mutually submit to each other. All right. Transformed by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. It says, and we, and we all, who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay. As disciples of Jesus, we reflect his glory. And that glory increases more and more as we transform to be more like him. Now, that word that is translated as transformed, okay, this one's challenging for me to say, but I'm going to give it my best, okay? Uh, metamorphmu, no, metamorphumatha, there, I got it, okay? That's a challenge. That's why I gave the little English transliteration of it for you when you're looking at this on your own sometime. Metamorphmu, no, I haven't said it wrong again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. But I want you to understand it's a passive verb, okay? We don't transform ourselves. We like to think, we as human beings like to think that, oh, I can just grunt myself into, you know, some kind of spiritual awesomeness. But we don't. I have failed over and over and over at that, okay? That the transformation comes from the Holy Spirit, not from, you know, my own gut. And it's good if we can just accept that, that that sometimes we don't have to fight the battle, that God will fight it for us and God will make the changes in us. So we don't transform ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit that transforms us. Now, that may be a very different way of thinking for you. It was for me that we've got to sometimes just sit back and let God work. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do anything. I'm not saying, saying that at all. But sometimes we do certain things and then God makes the changes. Okay. And he's a lot more powerful than we are. And so if he's making the changes, we're all a lot more likely to be successful. All right. Here's a quote from, uh, from a guy named Robert Foster with this in mind. The farmer is helpless to grow grain. All he can do is provide the right conditions for the growing of grain. He cultivates the ground, he plants the seed, he waters the plants, and then the natural forces of the earth take over and up comes the grain. This is the way it is with the spiritual disciplines. They are a way of sowing to the spirit. And what Foster's saying is correct. Now, I grew up on a farm. Okay, my dad was not a farmer, neither was I. But I did grow up on a farm. I haven't always been the smooth cosmopolitan man that you see here, right? Um, and what he's saying is correct. Farmers don't go out and make the crops grow. All they can do is make the conditions right, as, as perfect as they can. And that will allow them to grow. It is the natural forces of the earth that make crops grow. And it's the same thing with us. We're not going to make ourselves spiritually awesome. Okay? We're not going to fill ourselves with the spirit. The best thing that we can do is make ourselves as you know, a good soil, someone that God can make grow. That's the best that we can do. 
So we need to make sure that we do that. And I'm going to come back. He mentions the spiritual disciplines. I'm going to work my way back to that before I finish. Okay. You guys still with me? I know I've covered a lot of ground really fast, but I, yeah. I'm glad that you guys are still there. All right. Here's another verse for us to think about. Galatians chapter six, verse seven and eight. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Okay, what does this mean? First, two commands here. Don't sow to the spirit, or I'm sorry, don't sow to the flesh. Second command, sow to the spirit. But he, Paul says a lot more here. He says God's not going to be mocked, okay? And what he says is we can't expect to spend our time sowing to the flesh and reap the fruit of the spirit. It doesn't work like that, okay? Paul says if we think we can, we're deceiving ourselves and we're mocking God. And so we've got to sow to the spirit if we want to grow, okay? Now, what does this mean for us? It means that, you know, if you, if you spent yesterday binge watching eight hours of Netflix and five minutes of quiet time, okay, that's not really sowing to the spirit. And I'm not saying you can't watch Netflix. I mean, I got just as excited as anybody else about, uh, uh, about season four of Stranger Things when it came out, right? I watched it, okay, just like many of you did, right? But sometimes, we need to turn that off. Okay. I can remember having conversations with actually more than one brother who had spent 13 hours playing video games. Okay. And so, well, how are your quiet times going? Well, I, yeah, I've been having quiet times. Well, how long have they been? Well, you know, five minutes. That's not so into the spirit. Why would you think you're going to grow if you're going to, if, if that's your idea of sowing to the spirit, you're not going to. Okay. And so we've got to make sure that we're sowing to the spirit because if you know, if we think we're going to do all the sowing to the flesh and still grow, we're deceiving ourselves. Okay, so maybe you've got something that you've not been over, able to overcome. Maybe you need to sow to the spirit more. All right, just a thought. So here's some questions that I want you to think about. Okay, how are we transformed in the image of Christ through the spirit? Well, we're transformed by sowing to the spirit. Next question, how do we obey a command to be filled if we're not the ones doing the filling? We're so used to doing it ourselves, right? But God commands us to be filled with the Spirit, but we don't do the filling. So how do you obey that command? You do it by sowing to the Spirit. So how can we ensure that we're sowing to the Spirit and not sowing to the flesh? And the answer is by practicing the spiritual disciplines. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about, and some of you are going, well, I don't know what you're talking about. What are the spiritual disciplines? So here you go. Here's a list. This is not an exhaustive list, okay? There are probably many more. But I put the, this list of 21 together based on uh, the list from Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline, Dallas Willard's The Spirit of the Disciplines, and from Dr. Steve Kennard, okay? Which I took a class that he taught on the spiritual disciplines. And he had some that the other two didn't have, okay? Now, we don't have time to go through all of this, okay? Uh, I'm going to walk through it, and I'm just going to mention a couple because I've had questions about them from other people, okay? But there are things like meditation and Bible study and prayer and fasting where we're, you know, those are sort of the more traditional ones that we think about that, that you know, particularly Bible study and prayer where these are enabling us to walk with God and, and get closer to God and so to the spirit. Simplicity, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna match that up with another one in a little bit. Solitude, spending time alone with God, okay? Submission, both to God and, and to each other. Service, okay? Service, when, you, when, you're, when you're serving people and giving yourself to other people. You know, myself, by nature, I'm self-indulgent, okay? That's, that's just my nature. You may feel that way about yourself too. Maybe not. Serving people forces me to break myself out of that cycle of self-indulgence, and it enables me to grow and be closer to God. Confession, worship, guidance, you know, getting guidance, giving guidance sometimes. Celebration, which can go with worship. Silence, 
sometimes it's just good to just sit and be quiet before God. Okay, that can go with solitude as well. Frugality, right? And that can tie in with simplicity. Chastity, secrecy. Now, this is one that I've gotten a lot of questions. What does that mean, Tom? So I'll share with you. It doesn't mean hide your sin. That's not, it's not that kind of secret. It means to basically do some good, but don't tell anyone. Okay. Now I can tell you now because I, I haven't been doing this for a while, but um, a while back, several years ago, uh, there was an, an old woman that uh, couldn't get out to buy her groceries. And so every Friday I went to her house and I got her money and I went to the store and I brought her groceries and brought her groceries back to her. And I didn't tell anyone that I was doing this. I mean, my family knew, and that was about it. Okay. So this was something I, I did in secret. She died about six years ago, so I'm not doing this anymore. So, you know, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about is that you do something, but you don't boast about it. You know, look at what I've done. Okay. Although I did just do that. Okay. Um, sacrifice, fellowship, repentance, evangelism. And then the last one says 24 seven discipleship. And that's what Steve called it. Okay. But the idea was just being aware of God's presence all the time. Every, every moment, feeling the presence or being in the presence of God, you know. And I, I try to do this. It's hard. Like when I'm mowing the grass, I'm not always thinking, you know, I'm mowing, mowing for Jesus here. Okay. But I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to, to feel the presence or be in the presence of God every moment. Okay. And so as you look at this list, you could go, yeah, I'm going to do all that. Well, I would advise you to pick a couple and work on those spiritual disciplines, okay? Because just from the voice of experience, you know, um, that, you know, like on New Year's Day, I've had all these resolutions, you know, the super long list of resolutions. And, uh, you know, by the third, I've broken them all. And so what I've learned to do is that just take a couple of them and work on them diligently. So I've been working on, uh, you know, in, improving my prayer life. I've been trying to, to understand meditation. I've been trying to, to get this 24-7 discipleship to always be aware of the presence of God, you know. So try some of these things. It's, see if it will help you in your sowing to the Spirit. Okay. You guys still with me? Because we're about to land the plane here. You guys with me? Okay. Excellent. All right. So, Matthew 7, verse 17, likewise, a good tree bears good fruit, okay? And so we all want to be good trees. We want to bear good fruit. And how do we do it? By filling up with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to share an example with you that this verse also is very true, okay? When I bought this house that I live in in Totowa, New Jersey, in the backyard, there was a pear tree, right? And so I'm the next summer comes around and I'm thinking, I'm going to get all these pears, Okay, what happened was that the pears would come, they'd grow to be about the size of a marble, and then they would turn black and fall off the tree. They did not produce good pears. I was so disappointed. My dad has a pear tree in his yard, and it produces so many big, juicy pears that it about breaks the branches. Okay, it's a good pear tree. So we had to cut the pear, my pear tree down. And when we did, what did we see? it was all rotten on the inside. Okay. So this rotten tree didn't produce any good fruit. Okay. So we want to be the good tree that bears good fruit. And we will, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, if you're a baptized believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Just having it in you is not the goal. We want to be filled with it. And when we are, we will by nature, bear his fruit, okay? The same way my dad's good pear tree just naturally bore more pears than he could give away, okay? We're going to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be loving. We're going to be, you know, more joyous, more at peace, more gentle. I guess gentler would be the right word there, right? More faithful. We're going to bear those fruits. So, Let's keep in step with the Spirit. And that's what I got for you guys today.